we're, uh, we're blessed this morning to have church membership. And our, our church membership is, uh, I guess the way I explain it, is it's just a way of saying that this is who your hometown church family is going to be. When you say that, uh, I mean, everybody's part of the body of Christ around the world. We know that. That's uh, a given. When you accept Jesus Christ, when you're born again, and you become a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you join the family of God all around the world. But this is just a specific way for you to say that this is where I want to get plugged in. This is where I want my family to be. This is where I want to, to give back to the Lord of my time and talents and resources and energy and spiritual gifts, where I want to invest those and, and also where I want to receive, where I want to receive, hopefully, godly counsel and where I want to be accountable with one another, with brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's a great, a great way to get connected in the body of Christ. And so I'm going to ask this morning for all those who are ready to join our church in church membership, if you will please come and stand at the front and face the congregation. And Parkway, let's welcome them as they come. Amen. Y'all just come right over here. This is great. This is great. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, hand the microphone over and have each one introduce themselves. And then we're going to pray for these precious folks as they're joining our fellowship. And then we're going to do things the old-fashioned way. We're just all the Parkway members are just going to line up against that wall and file by and welcome our, park, our new Parkway members with a right hand of fellowship. We're going to bless them. And for the right hand of fellowship, that doesn't mean you slap them on the face or yeah, that's a shake, shaking hands. So, uh, amen. So let's introduce ourselves. Ella Lay. Rob Sweet. Marlene Wade. I'm Keith Wade. Jenny Roche. Caleb Roche. Amen. Let's welcome them all. Amen. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to stretch your hands this way, and let's pray a prayer of blessing over these that are joining. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for these that are joining our congregation, Father. And I bless them in the name of the Lord. I bless their coming in, their going out, their rising up, their sitting down. I ask you, Father, to bless them in Jesus' name. Father, that, and I plead the blood of Jesus over each one of them and ask you to stand guard and stand watch over them, to guard them, to protect them, to keep them safe, to watch over them, to be with them in every way. Father, we're asking in Jesus' name that they would be abundantly blessed, that they would prosper in all things, that they would be in good health, and especially that their souls would prosper. Father, that you would connect them in the body where they're able to give of their talents and energy and resources and spiritual gifts where they can get plugged in in the body. And Father, help them also to receive everything that you have them to receive. Father, in your goodness and your, in your mercy and your love, you give us brothers and sisters in Christ to pour themselves into us as well as we pour into them. Lord, you, we love one another. We pray for one another. We encourage one another. Father, that's what this church is all about. And Father, we're asking that you enable each of these to get plugged in in the body in Jesus' name. And Father, we're asking that this would just be the beginning of great and mighty things as they're joining our congregation. Father, let this be a new beginning for them and, and a, blessed, a blessed time for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's line up and welcome them in. A pastor who loves to help the handicapped. Amen. <laughs> I 
I can truthfully say that it's a joy to be with you because you welcome the presence of God. That's so obvious from the very first song that the choir sang, that the congregation sang, that the worship team led. You've been preparing us for this week of thanksgiving. And I say hallelujah, to God be the glory. He is so good in all of his ways. Amen. Those of you that have been around for a while know that we've been coming here the last 13 years to meet our sons and have Thanksgiving together with our family. And it's always a joy to be in service with you when we come. And I'm so thankful that as the world changes, so does your church. In fact, this is the third building that I've worshipped in with you all. <laughs> and I praise God for how he continues to lead you and to bless you and to anoint you and to give you six new members up here this morning. To God be the glory. He is a wonderful Lord in all that he does. Hallelujah. Now, in the 13 years that we've been coming here, there have not only been changes in your congregation, but there have been changes in our society and in our world. And right now, at this time of Thanksgiving, we are also very concerned about some of those things that are taking place in our world. Our hearts have gone out to the people of France and the people of Mali and the people of Lebanon and all of the places in Europe where the migrants are coming. I don't know any other word to use for our world except turmoil. Our world is in a turmoil. And as I stand before you today, I realize that the reality for our culture now is vastly different from the reality that we had just 13 short years ago. We are living in a time of new reality. And the Lord has led me to mention this new reality to you all today, to tell you some of the characteristics which you've already seen, but to share with you how these characteristics are influencing Christians, and also to show you that from the scriptural standpoint, the new reality's emergence is really the fulfillment of the old scriptures and prophecies that we find in God's Word. We should have been expecting it, shouldn't we? <laughs> and I thank the Lord that I have this opportunity to bring these thoughts together with you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. If you would stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word. I'm reading from the modern English version. And the Word of the Lord says, For this we say to you by the Word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Hallelujah. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together 
with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall be forever with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for the promises that you have given to us, that even as we see the darkness closing in around us, we realize that the light of Jesus Christ in the church and in our hearts just shines brighter than ever because of the darkness. And so for that, during this week of Thanksgiving, we give you thanks and we give you praise because we know that the traits of this new reality are not messages of doom and gloom. They are not creating a gap between us and the world that is insurmountable. But we realize that in fulfillment of God's word, this is the time that the church shall draw closer and closer to the Lord, even as the times of difficulty, darkness, and persecution continue to rise round about us. And for that, we give you glory and we give you honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The first thing I want to do is just list these 12 things that I have written down that I know are different from how things were when I was growing up 150 years ago. Thank you for laughing. I thought I did look that old. Okay. In this time in which we live, it is customary and it is strongly believed by most people that truth is definitively perceived only through the human reason. I'm sad to say that, but that's where we have come in our thoughts. We also have reached a place where we teach that all religions are just different paths to the same God. And as I read these, you'll realize how opposite they are from the teachings of the Word of God. We've come to the point of believing that human rights are cultural instead of divine, spiritual, and universal. We've reached the place in our society where economics and security preempt compassion when it comes to the poor and when it comes to immigrants. This world in which we live views the separation of church and state as public secularism. I never thought I would see America become so secular as it is in the process of becoming. And we've come to state in our society that the freedom of religious expression is acceptable only in the home or in the church. It wasn't that way when you were going to school. If you were like I was, you started the day with prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance also, of course. And most of the athletic activities were open with prayer. Most of the civic group meetings were open with prayer. But religious expression today is acceptable only in the home or in the church. And this world in which we live is saying that religious institutions use 
religious liberty just to excuse their discrimination. Have you heard that? And we have come to accept that abortion is acceptable for any reason agreed upon between the patient and the doctor. This new reality in which we live says that same-sex attraction is predetermined at birth. It's not a learned experience, it is an inherited experience. This society teaches that marriage and divorce are based on positive feelings and mutual attraction instead of commitment. And that marriage is acceptable between people of any gender. And that cohabitation is acceptable as long as both parties are faithful to each other. Now you've been quiet because you don't particularly like this society. And neither do I. And it becomes increasingly more difficult for a Christian to live in a world where the majority view is not the view of the Bible. But we have reached that place in our society. And that place is bringing changes to how we as Christians must adjust and adopt. And that's the second thing that I want to emphasize to you this morning. But before I leave this, I want to say that all of this darkness and all of this negative, anti-scriptural process that I've been talking about, I'm healed, I guess, I can use it. <laughs> All of this negative stuff, anti-Bible stuff, is not a message of doom and gloom because as the world gets darker, the light of Christ shines brighter. <laughs> Hallelujah. The more we think about these negative things that go against all the Bible teaches us, the more we will learn to accept that in our own lives we must draw closer and closer to the Lord even as society is getting farther and farther away from Him. Some preachers are saying that this gap is so big that it can't be bridged. But I want to remind you that the early church was born in such a society. They were a minority sect in a pagan majority known as Rome. And they had to live in that pagan majority even though they were in such a small, minute minority. And as our world gets more and more like pagan Rome, then we're going to have the anointing of the Holy Ghost within us to live more and more like Jesus Christ and to serve Him and to walk in holiness and to accept sanctification, and to believe in the baptism in the Holy Ghost, this is a time, hallelujah, when the gap is going to create two things. One, the Christians are going to realize they've get, get, got to get closer, and the unbelievers, because the Christians and believers are getting closer, are going to wax more and more eloquent in their persecution. 
we're going to see that happen. It will not be an easy time for the church, but it will be a glorious time. Hallelujah. Not all glorious things are easy. I remember the crucifixion of our Lord as a glorious plan of redemption, but it was far from easy. And if I'm going to be like Christ, I'm not going to mind the hardships when I know that it is the right ship to be in. As long as we are serving the Lord of glory, we can accept him to be the guide in our lives and other changes that are taking place in us. The biblical views that are held by believers will increasingly be classified as prejudiced, bigoted, and narrow-minded. We've seen it. We see it coming. I know it's not here yet like it is already in other parts of the world. And in fact, the church was born in persecution. The church will be raptured in the midst of persecution. And the church and Christians have known persecution throughout all of our history. But the thing that gets to us here in America is that our worldview has been Christ-centered. And we have been a gospel-sending nation. And so it has been foreign to us to realize that these things could actually take place. But church, they're taking place. They are coming our way. They are getting stronger. But the Holy Ghost within you is getting more powerful than ever before. And he's going to help you stand, he's going to help you live, and he's going to help you be resurrected when Jesus Christ comes again. Praise the Lord. I believe that our understanding of love in America is also going to deepen. Because... It's not easy for us in America to love those who openly defy Scripture and say that it's all right to do certain things and, and to even pass laws saying same-sex couples should be allowed to marry and have families right alongside of a man and a woman. And, and the love that we have for people who stand up and say that has not been all that strong. In fact, we've, we have spoken out quite strongly against them. But I believe God is going to give us a love greater than we've ever experienced for those who are lost without God. I believe he's going to give us a love stronger than ever before in our hearts for those who are even our persecutors so that we will be able to have the true love of God living in our hearts and flowing out of our hearts and touching people round about us. And I want you to know that that is how this gap is going to be closed. It's not going to be closed by voting for one political party or another. It's not going to be closed by philosophies that are created in a university classroom. This gap is not going to be closed by do-gooders, so-called, in society. This gap is only going to be closed by the love of Almighty God living in the church, living in our hearts, and changing this world for Jesus Christ. I believe that with all my heart. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Lord. As our cultural reality becomes more sinful, believers will become stronger in their Christian convictions. I don't know about you, but I've noticed already that as some of these things have been proclaimed as the law and as the new gospel and the new reality, more Christians have begun turning to the Word of God to see why they really believe that these things are wrong. And I thank God for that change. Hallelujah. I thank God for anything that will drive men and women to the Word of God and let them learn the truth of God's Word. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. All of this is prophesied. The emergence of this new reality is really just the fulfillment of old prophecies. And I am so glad to tell you that even though Christianity will, was born in persecution and has survived through persecution and will be raptured from persecution, that Christianity is in the state right now where it is proving the coming of Jesus Christ is closer than it has ever been before. I believe that as we study the Word of God, we are able to see that the scoffers have not got a foot to stand on because the scoffers are saying, this gospel's been preached for thousands of years. And if, and if you believe in the Old Testament prophecies, even longer than that, and they've not happened yet. People will say, when I was a little child, I heard the coming of Jesus being preached, but he's not come yet. And even the scriptures say, in the end of time, scoffers will arise saying, where is the coming of the Lord? I'll tell you where it is. It's 2,000 years closer than it was when Jesus walked on this earth. And 2,000 years is a pretty long time. And I thank the Lord that we are 2,000 years closer to the coming of the Lord than we were to his going away the first time. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's important for you to leave here today knowing that I believe, and I believe I should tell you, that the persecution that is coming your way will not be because of who you are, but it will be because of who you serve. This world doesn't care so much about a couple of preachers named Philip Morris. <laughs> but this world does care about the name Jesus Christ so much that if you want to pray at a high school baccalaureate, they tell you not to use his name. Don't pray in the name of Jesus. That's because this new reality does not appreciate the person whom we serve, Jesus Christ. This new reality is not new in many parts of the world. We've seen on TV just recently how people have been killed because they were Christians. Not long ago, we heard of one terrorist in our own country that was in a high school, and before he killed people, he was asking them if they were Christians. You say, well, that's just one case. I know, but it may be the beginning case. I think we need to be serious about this. It, I wanted so much 
to preach a joyous sermon of thanksgiving for Thanksgiving week. But the Lord kept bringing me back to this because this is the time in which we, we live. This is the reality which we inhabit and we need to know about it and we need to be ready for what it is getting ready for in the order of future events. And that is the rapture of Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church. Many prophecies have already been fulfilled. In Matthew 24 alone, we know that the Jews have already returned to their homeland. Israel has already become a nation. Jerusalem has already been recaptured by the Jews. Christianity has already been preached in all the nations of the world. We have watched our TV as wars and natural disasters have already increased. And unfortunately, right in our own living rooms, we have seen Christians persecuted and killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. These things are already upon us. But the next thing that happens is going to be the greatest event since Calvary. And that is the same Son of God that hung on a tree. Hallelujah. That same Jesus Christ is soon going to descend on a cloud preceded by a shout of the archangel and a trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first as we read before and then we who are alive, that's you, that's me, we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them in the clouds, with the Lord in the air. And we'll be with him forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Blessed be the wonderful name of the Lord our God. Thank you, Lord. I hope that this has shown you to some degree that the emergence of this new social order, this new reality, is really leading up to the fulfillment of biblical prophecies. And if you are a believer, it is time for you to ask the Lord to dwell in your hearts, guide you in understanding the Word of God, enabling you to live a holy life, commissioning you to be separate and apart from the world order, and not be caught up in this new reality, but to be a child of God. Hallelujah. That's what our prayers are as believers. And if you're here this morning and you are not a believer, I want you to know that it is getting closer and closer to the time when you need to be ready to go with the Lord in the air. And if you are not ready this morning, you can get ready. You're in the right place. You're surrounded by people who love you. You're surrounded by prayer warriors who are willing to pray with you and lift you up and hold you up, not just for a momentary experience, but for a whole Christian walk throughout all of your life. And that's what I challenge you with this morning. If you're not a believer... Give your life to Jesus Christ and be ready to go with the Lord in the air. Will you stand with me for prayer?
Lord, we are keenly aware of your presence in this place. We sense your Holy Spirit in our hearts, but we also sense your holy presence in this sanctuary. For this is the place where burdens are left, left behind, where sicknesses are healed, where sinful people can find redemption and eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we're standing in the midst of that with hearts that are open and filled with thanksgiving and praise because you're so good to us. And we worship you right now. And we thank you right now. And for every believer here, we pray together that you would fill us so full of your Holy Spirit that wherever we go, whatever group we are in, whether we are talking or participating, that they will know there is a difference because of the light of Jesus Christ shining in our lives. May that be true for all of the believers here today. And for those who are not believers, precious Lord, by your Holy Spirit right now, I pray that you would speak to them and let them know how much you love them and want them to be in your arms and in your family throughout all eternity. Let them know that you are just waiting to receive them and bring them into the family of God. This we pray in the name of Jesus. And with your eyes closed and your heads still bowed, I would like to ask if there is anyone here who is a believer, but you feel like you have come short in the love that you have toward those who are leading our society in the wrong path. And perhaps you have even felt hostility toward some of the ones who have created the laws and those who are living by the new laws that are anti-scriptural. And you need more of the love of God in your life. Would you just step out from your seats and stand up here so I can have a closing prayer with you? If you feel like that love in you is not deep enough yet, like the Lord would want it to be, and you want it to be stronger, you want to love those who despitefully use you. Are there others that will step forward? Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate that. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I know I was in a Bible study last week, and a lady requested prayer. She said, Church, I really need to have more love for homosexuals. That's just one sin that I've not been able to fit into my thinking. And I need more love to love the homosexual. Even though that may not be your problem, maybe it's some other type of person that you have trouble loving. God wants to give you sufficient love. Are there any others of you that would step out and say, yes, Brother Morris, I need a greater love for this time that I'm facing in our new reality. Thank you, Lord. Yes, amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. God bless you.
Since the believers are standing on my left, that leaves the right-hand side open. And I would like to invite any of you who have not given your life to Jesus Christ. And you know that if the Lord were to come to rapture the church right now, that you probably would not be ready to go. But you want to be ready. If that's your desire, would you come and stand on my right-hand side, please, so we can have prayer for you. Anyone here in the church, I don't know for sure whether or not I'm ready to meet the Lord, but I want to be. I want to be sure. Anyone in the congregation? You can lift your heads, church, and look this way because I want to talk to all of you. I really believe that this is a time of decision for the church. I, I think that it is more tempting than ever for the church to say, we want to be acceptable to society. We don't want to be persecuted or looked down upon. But this is a time when we must take a stand. We have got to let the light of Jesus Christ live in us and shine out from us. And we've got to be motivated by his love that we can be drawn into his family. And that's why I've taken so long in this invitation. And thank you all for being so honest that you want more love for people in your world. And I ask all of you now just to bow your heads and stretch your arms forward to these seven that have come to the altar this morning. And let's pray a special prayer for them right now. Hallelujah. Blessed Lord Jesus, we thank you for the openness and honesty of these who have come forward asking for more of your divine love to be exhibited in their lives toward those that are difficult to love. Lord, we all know that we're not perfect, and we need your help in so many ways. But this morning, we are emphasizing how much we need your love to live in our hearts, to change us, and to change our view toward a sinful society. Help us, Lord, not only to be changed, but to be anointed by the Holy Spirit to share in testimony as well as example your love and reach out to those who are in need of the love of God in their hearts as well. Change our lives, Lord. We're not satisfied to be like we've been just going ahead with church as usual, but we want a divine, supernatural love that will change our whole view of this world in which we live. And let that love help us reach out to others, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for that, Lord. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. And before you're seated, would the seven of you that are standing up here, would you just take a minute to shake hands with each, each other and tell each other that you're going to be praying for the love of God to live in their hearts. And it would be good for everybody to do that. Let the love of God live in our hearts. We thank you for this. Praise the Lord. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord.